So the reason for this video is, is kind of twofold. Um, first, it's really just a short homage to a gun that I absolutely love, this beautiful thing that you see here in front of you, the Smith & Wesson Model 645. But the motivation to make the video, at least right now, uh, was driven by my favorite uh, podcast, Handgun Radio, on the Firearms Radio Network, which is my favorite podcast network. Every once in a while, they'll do a thing they call loadout. You know, they'll ask people, what's your, you know, 1890 loadout or your, you know, maybe 1932 loadout or, or whatever the case might be, in which case the, the listeners write in with, uh, you know, well, if I lived in, you know, 1890, I would be carrying this gun and this knife and dressing in this fashion and that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a fun, interesting way to hear uh, different people's ideas about what would be the appropriate, um, the appropriate um, weaponry and clothing and other accessory of the day. So they just recently said that they're going to have a what they're calling the Miami Vice loadout. So Miami Vice was a popular TV show in the mid 1980s, uh, actually 85 on, I think, um, maybe 86. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, mid 1980s, and it ran for, I don't know, five or six years, however long the show ran. So when you say Miami Vice, I almost immediately, being a gun guy, I almost immediately have a picture of this gun in my head. And there's a very good reason for that. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But first, I do want to take a minute to just plug my good friends, Ryan Machad and Weird Beard of Handgun Radio. It really is my favorite podcast to listen to. It's like spending, you know, an hour, maybe an hour and a half, if I'm lucky, uh, every week with, with friends listening to them talk about handguns or movies or what's their favorite drink or you know just uh it's just a pleasant way to spend some time so i highly encourage you if you've never heard it please go look it up handgun radio on the firearms radio network i've actually been a guest on the show a couple of times but please don't hold that against them um you know other than those two episodes it really is a good show so the Model 645 Smith & Wesson is a second-generation semi-automatic pistol from Smith & Wesson. came out in 1985, and it was only made until 1988. Very short-lived handgun. It is 45 ACP. This was the first pistol that Smith & Wesson ever made in 45 ACP. They had, they had previously never ventured into that caliber, and back in those days... Because I lived in those days, <laughs> and I can tell you firsthand, back in those days, the 45 ACP was basically the Colt 45. And what we refer to now commonly as the Model 1911 was referred to as the Colt 45. Because Colt pretty much had, they didn't have exclusive manufacture of it. There were a lot of people making it, but that's just how it was, how it was known. And so you either went Colt or you went Smith & Wesson. So this was the first time that the folks at Smith & Wesson adopted America's cartridge in their handguns, and I thought they did a really nice job of it. Not everybody agreed. Jeff Cooper almost hated this gun. He, in his way, politely <laughs> said so, but uh, he didn't like it at all, and uh, it wasn't you know, it wasn't too widely received, obviously, because it only ran in production for three years. But I don't care about any of that because that was a long time ago. I still have the one that I bought brand new right when they first came out. And I'm keeping it. So when I heard Ryan and Weird talking about doing another loadout episode, I was interested, of course, because the last one was a lot of fun to listen to. And this one really piqued my interest because they said it was going to be a Miami Vice loadout. So just to set the context a little bit for that, for me personally, is back when Miami Vice was a brand new show running on TV in, you know, first runs, I already had my concealed carry permit. And a matter of fact, I already had an FFL. I was already into guns as not only, you know, sport and activity and fun, 
but also for, you know, personal defense and all that kind of stuff, too. One of the guns that the character uh, Sonny Crockett, played by Don Johnson, carried, I think it was the third and fourth season, I know for a couple seasons anyway, carried the Smith & Wesson Model 645. I remember seeing the Smith & Wesson Model 645 first announced by Smith & Wesson, and I remember that, again, I had my FFL. I put in an order immediately <laughs> to get myself one, and I got one um, right, right away, right when they first came out. I got that gun. Um, and then, you know, later I was able to, uh, to see it make its appearance on Miami Vice, but I already had it by then. I had mine before he had his. So the Model 645 was all the rage for a time, uh, even made the cover of my favorite gun magazine, uh, both then and now, American Handgunner magazine. Uh, it graced the cover of that, and there was a lot of, of to-do about it. But unfortunately, the gun only was produced for three years, I think, three or four years by Smith & Wesson, from like 85 to 89 or 88 or something like that. It had a really short run, but I liked it. I, I liked it quite a bit. Um, I liked it so much so that I still have it, and uh, I don't still carry it <laughs> very often. Okay, so given that, I did carry concealed back in those days. My, my Miami Vice loadout is going to be exactly what it was back in those days. So what are the things we talk about when we talk about loadouts? Well, the first thing is the Model 645 in stainless, full stainless steel, in a cross-draw shoulder holster from Galco, and on your strong side, two extra magazines, because remember, it's 45 ACP, and these magazines hold eight rounds apiece. Now, I do have an extended 10-round magazine in the gun. Those 10-round magazines weren't available until years later. Uh, they weren't initially available for the gun, so you were limited to eight, but in those days, that was standard capacity. So what would I be wearing? Well, I might be wearing an insulated vest, something like this, if it was cold outside, but more often than not, I was wearing a windbreaker or a leather jacket, or maybe I was being stylish and I was wearing a linen blazer with the sleeves pushed up just a little bit. Shoes were either going to be sneakers or dock siders. They had to be comfortable and casual and make the world think that you just didn't care about anything. If it was a little hot outside, instead of wearing a jacket or something like that, you'd be wearing an oversized Hawaiian shirt or maybe a pastel colored linen shirt that was one, at least one size too big for you, give you extra room for that shoulder holster. Of course, you had to be wearing aviators that were about two sizes bigger than your face and you had to have the hair helmet. So when I got all that together, got my clothes of the day, I'm fashionable, I got the gun of the day, the model 645 from Smith & Wesson, I got the cool sunglasses and the hair helmet, I grabbed my car keys and I would jump in exactly what I drove back in those days, my 1968 black Camaro, and off I went. And of course your clothes were usually clean linen white, but if you had to wear colors, those colors had to be pastels, like a soft pink. So in honor of that, soft pink target, downrange. So now maybe you know why I kind of giggle a little bit when people cry about concealed carry guns being too big, too heavy. <laughs> this gun weighs about two and a half pounds almost. It's about as big as an AMC Gremlin, popular car back in those days. Made out of stainless steel like a DeLorean, another car that was popular back in those days. But it feels great in the hand and <laughs> It shoots like a dream. I've always loved shooting this gun. Now, one of the things that I always did think was a nice piece of engineering by Smith & Wesson on the 645, just like on the 39 series pistols, where you have this safety decocker. When you load the gun, you can see I'm just getting ready to chamber the first round. I've got the magazine in it. 
But when you load the gun, you can put that down before you bring the slide home. And then, by either racking the slide or hitting the slide release, in this case, I'm going to hit the slide release, what it's going to do is it's automatically going to decock the hammer safely so that there's absolutely no way that that gun can discharge. So the hammer drop safety is what they called it. Smith & Wesson called it a hammer drop safety, not a decocker. It can be done as a, uh, as a preventative measure as well. And I always thought that was a nice feature. And of course, back in those days, it was also very fashionable to shoot wrong and put your support hand index finger up here on the front of the trigger guard. And they made a very nicely knurled, checkered <laughs> area for you to do that if you felt like shooting wrong. I never could, uh, never could get the hang of shooting wrong, so I don't do it. Once again, you can charge the gun and drop the hammer at the same time. Go straight to double action. And also, have that dead trigger safety on. So, good feature. Still, I think, a good feature by Smith & Wesson. And one of the nicest double action pulls, especially if it's era. Yep. <laughs> there goes that lever. <laughs> God, I hate that lever. And when I ordered this gun, the ambidextrous decocker safety, which you see right here in the safe position, uh, was optional. It came with one just on the right hand, like this, or on the left side of the pistol for right-handed shooters. And it was an option to get it ambidextrous. And I chose that option. I said, yeah, yeah, I want all the bells and whistles. <laughs> I want the ambidextrous one. Um, even though to this day, I remain only right-handed. That's one of the main things I've never liked about this gun. That damn screw will not stay tight. I have put every kind of Loctite you can imagine in that thing. Um, and I remember back, back in the day, my dad was a gunsmith, and I, he used to try and get it to tighten down for me. You just cannot keep that thing tight. So I just took a break to go get my tools and tighten that bad boy. So I'm hoping it'll stay snug for a little bit but that's one of the things I never really cared for. All right, let's finish out this last magazine of my Miami Vice loadout. It's 1985 all over again. I wish I felt a little more like I did in 1985, but what the heck. I can still shoot. I still have the gun that I beloved in those days and that I still think of very fondly now, and it still shoots great. So. That is a good thing.